Okay, thank you everyone for coming out to B-Sides. Appreciate uh, everyone taking time out of their day, their Fridays to come down. So I just wanna start off by first thanking the sponsors. I know it's been really chaotic with the pandemic, uh, but really appreciate the support from DigiCert and RSA and Hope Tech and Adobe and Red Canary and Corelight and Redpoint and Mimecast and SaltStack. Um, so appreciate the sponsors. So this is the B-Size logo for this year. Uh, Delane did a great job getting that created, so appreciate her hard work on that. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I, I am Bryce Coons. I typically wear these Hawaiian shirts, so if you're looking for someone with a Hawaiian shirt around the con, that may be me. Uh, my handle on Twitter is TweakFox, and there's a B-Side Slack that you should be able to join from the bsidesslc.org website. There's a link to join it. So if you ever have any questions, you can just throw them in general in B-Sides, and I should respond in a reasonable time period. Well, welcome to B-Sides, Salt Lake City. Glad to have this back uh, in person. So um, the slogan for B-Sides is, is really by the people, for the people. So I know there's always areas we can do better as a group, as organizers, um, but largely this conference is, is here because of you and the people who are willing to come out and provide the content. So, um, you know, if there's gaps that you see this year and, you know, think could be better, you know, we'd love to have your help on in future years. Really, there's four core principles of a B-Sides event. Um, so, and, and the first is really like, we wanna create an environment where you can have meaningful conversations with the other participants here, right? So intentionally the word participant is used, right? Because we want you know, everyone here to be part of the community and, and feel actively engaged. And then the second is really connections. We want everyone here to be able to make a few new connections. Um, there's some rooms upstairs, uh, smaller rooms that are available for just kind of um, chilling out and breakout sessions and one of them's got some um, soldering irons. Uh, so feel free to go in there and you know, kind of hang out. Uh, the third principle is community. We're really trying to strengthen the community, help us grow, especially in the area of cybersecurity. And the fourth is careers, kind of a side effect of us all coming together and building relationships is people are able to improve their careers and we're able to help each other out more. So if you're wondering where these four principles come from, um, I, did not, I, I did not invent them. So they, they are from a Jack Daniels talk that he did previously at, at B-Sides. So, so we're kind of taking our direction from um, you know, the legacy here. I'm just gonna go over some logistics with the venue real quickly. And then I'm just gonna, then I'll talk a little bit about some of the recent events in cybersecurity. So here at the venue, you're in the main hall. Uh, that's track one. Uh, if you go up the stairs, there's two additional tracks. Track two has talks. Uh, those talks are over um, Zoom, so the speakers there are remote. Um, but feel free to go in there and check out those talks. As well as track three, there are some workshops. Um, there's a red teaming workshop as well as a great container workshop um, this afternoon. So. Highly encourage you to check those out and yeah, participate in them. Uh, the three rooms that are down the hall, the three end rooms on track two, uh, you're welcome to go in there. There's power um, in the latter two rooms, 226 and 228. Uh, you're welcome to just chill in there and do whatever you want. In 229, I believe Waylon will be hanging out in there and answering any questions you may have about the, elect the electronic badges. Right, we went over this, great. And then these are the breakout rooms here. Uh, 229 is where the badge will be located at. So the schedule is located on the website. The only one um, update is that it says that this session starts at 10 p.m. Uh, it does not, it starts at 10 a.m. So uh, that was just a typo. <laughs> 
Okay, so here's kind of a screenshot of the, of the schedule. Things to note um, is that at 11 a.m. right here, we'll be having a hacker panel. Um, Snow, Grifter, and Lean will, will be um, answering questions, and Marv will be asking the questions. So I highly encourage you to check that out. Um, those are three great people that are all local to this area in Utah, and um, it's usually a, a good time as had by all. So um, at the end of the day, at 5 p.m., Waylon will be giving a badge talk about the electric badge. Um, so uh, there is a CTF, or like a challenges, inside of the badge. Um, so uh, he may give some useful hints at that point. So. And he'll also be up in that chill out room throughout the day. Uh, we have a few remote talks in track two, so definitely check those out. Since those are look really well polished. And track three, there's just two workshops. The container security one looks great, um, as well as the red teaming one. Okay, so the B-Sides team, um, Delane got this sweet swag, so hopefully you got yourself a beanie. If you purchased a student ticket and you did not get a beanie, um, you're at the end of tomorrow, I am giving away the swag. So come back and we'll give you a beanie, so if there's any left. Um, there is, I think we produced 200 beanies and we sold more than 200 tickets, so. Um, Okay, Waylon created the badge. There's challenges associated with the badge. If you are one of the first people to solve that, there is a prize for that. Come and show Waylon that you solved it, and and you can um, you can get that prize from Waylon. It's pretty obvious if you solved it. Like all these snow lights are like blinking, so it, the badge looks cooler, right? Really appreciate all the hard work Waylon puts into this badge. I can't tell you how many hours he puts into it. So really appreciate that. This is an FYI, this is kind of some of the organizers that helped with the event. Really appreciate everyone's help. Um, really would not be possible without these individuals and all the hard work they put into it. And once again, just want to thank the sponsors. They, um, they, they make this possible, right? As an FYI, uh, we created an, a nonprofit of 501c3. Uh, that runs this B-Sides conference here in Salt Lake City. So um, as part of your, if you purchase a ticket, as part of your ticket, you have the right to be a member of that nonprofit, right? Um, this is the board for the nonprofit. So uh, I am on the board and I'm also um, the lead executing the con, right? So um, if you're interested in what that means or whatnot, uh, you can always hit me up in Slack. I'm there in the Slack, as well as um, there's a website with a little bit of information, and there's my email there for the nonprofit. So happy to talk with you, with you more about that. Okay, so great. Okay, so that was just some logistics associated with the con. I, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to hit anybody up. We're all pretty friendly. Um, out there in Reg, or just come and talk to me. Um, I'm happy to help. So, and I'll point you to the right person if I'm not that. Okay, so I just want to talk about 2021. 2021 was an interesting year. We're still kind of mid the pandemic, so that's um, you know that's that's you know life now. And I appreciate everybody following the the rules that are posted on the website regarding the health standards here at the conference, including wearing masks and um, and you know having the appropriate tests or vaccines. So appreciate everyone being, uh, letting us follow the industry norms there. So, but 2021 actually had some really cool things in cybersecurity. So one of my favorite is that in January, there was a bug, an O-Day release for the Sudo binary, right? So the Sudo binary, if you get on a Linux box as a normal user, it allows you to change into the root user account, right? Kind of that level of separation between user and root level access. And there was an over 10 year bug, which enables someone to just basically exploit a vulnerability in the app and get root privileges on a box. So, so super cool bug. Um, in March, 
we saw oh, multiple O days, I believe four O days came out for the Microsoft Exchange servers, and then we saw rapidly cyber criminals start to leverage those. So that was you know, also pretty exciting from a cybersecurity standpoint. Then in the May, we saw the Colonial Pipeline, which maybe didn't affect us so much here in Utah, but literally shut down gas stations in you know, the Washington DC area and across the East Coast. So we saw you know, cyber attacks really have a real world you know, kinetic impact there. Um, you know, we've seen multiple breaches across the year. That seems, you know, from LinkedIn to Neiman's Marcus to Twitch. And then we saw the kind of Microsoft's response there with the print spooler vulnerabilities in, in July, where, you know, they thought the uh, report, you know, vulnerabilities were reported to Microsoft in the print spooler service. They thought they fixed it. When researchers looked, they found ways to bypass the fixes, and they kept moving and moving and moving. So. So, really interesting year. A lot of O days have come out um, that are kind of high impact here. And, um, you know, explicitly that Microsoft Exchange, it, it, they estimated it impacted over 250,000 organizations in the US alone, right? So, cyber criminals were going through and basically any Exchange server they could get to, they were using these O days to get code execution on them. The pipeline, you know, caused fuel shortages throughout the East Coast. And then the Prince Fuller, rapidly, as soon as that was discovered, you know, cyber criminals and ransomware groups started to use that. The example I found easily was, you know, in South Korea, uh, victims were reporting they'd been hit using this, so. Okay, so I just want to talk for a minute about roadmaps for improvements, right? So what, what can we do as a cybersecurity community to really improve the overall security posture? You know, there's a lot of these incidents and breaches occurring. What can we do as a group to really um, defend against that? And, you know, this isn't a comprehensive list. This is just kind of like the top recommendations that I put together. So, so first is reduce attack services, right? So, and generally speaking, it's good to know what your attack surfaces are, right? Um, then try to limit them or reduce them as much possible. So, so um, you know, zero trust is really the modern day solution for reducing attack surfaces. It's trying to make, you know, old school lateral movement techniques non, uh, non applicable. So in, in the traditional model, you know, you would send a spear phishing or phishing email into an organization. The user would click on the email they'd get code execution on the endpoint, and then they would subsequently start scanning the internal systems inside of that enterprise, and they would move laterally from that beachhead system onto other boxes in the network and uh, expand their access like that. Well, there's really not a, a, a great use case why systems in that internal network, you know, why one workstation would really need to talk to another workstation. Maybe workstations need to talk to servers, you know, maybe they need to talk to a file server or maybe they need to talk to an app, like a web application server, but there's not really a really strong reason there that, they, they, that one person's laptop would need to directly talk to another person's laptop. So, so zero trust has got a lot of buzz behind it, but the basic of the concept is every endpoint is going to authenticate to kind of like a, a central point, which is gonna say which systems they can access in the network and then that greatly reduces the amount of attack surface or options an attacker has from moving laterally. So they basically have to go from the endpoint to another server inside the, inside of the, inside of the organization. And um, yeah, so that's, that's one, one approach, right? I'm not, and uh, you know, all the zero trust vendors have their own way of implementing that, but, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's really helpful. Um, but there's other ways you could implement that, right? I mean, it could be just as simple as implementing firewall rules on your local, on your laptops, right? Using Windows Active Directory to roll out Windows firewalls rules, preventing people from connecting to certain ports and services from certain IP addresses. Another thing that I, I strongly recommend is, is really just getting a real solid multi-factor authentication strategy going at, at your enterprise. Um, so, you know, a lot of those will involve, um, 
you know, the use of either verification via kind of a push notification to your phone or app, um, or they'll involve the use of a hardware token, right? And th those are those are an excellent ways to upgrade your overall security game as an organization, uh, primarily because it shifts the, t the focus, right? So in, in the past, attackers, they really want to get those usernames and passwords. Sometimes they get them from breach data. We've all probably heard about, you know, password spraying or, and all that type of attacks. And, and that's generally where, you know, you would have one password that you know is weak and a list of accounts and you would try that same password against all the accounts. So, so an example of that is maybe you would try, you know, winter 2021 and you would try that ever against everyone's account in an organization and hopefully it would work as somebody's password in the organization to get you a foothold in. So MFA, the couple things it does. Two, one, you know, username and password is no longer enough. It, it makes you have another third uh, piece of material, uh, key material to authenticate. Two, it generally is gonna involve some type of timeout, right? So when you authenticate successfully, you'll generally get like an SSO token in your browser. Maybe you're using Octo or another similar service and you start passing those to other applications and they, they recognize your token and they authenticate you. So, so, um, so you're gonna have to re-authenticate at some point. So even if there is a breach, you're gonna time limit the amount of time uh, the attacker can dwell without having to re-obtain those credentials, gen generally speaking. And you know, a lot of this is dependent on your specific implementation. So. Um, so that's kind of uh, a good recommendation. I, I don't want to say that any of this stuff that I've just talked about is foolproof, so please don't take that away as foolproof. And that's why my third recommendation comes into play, which is continually test, right? You think you have a good plan. You think you've reduced the tax service. You think two factors working. All right, now test it, right? Get someone in or have someone in your team actually go and see if they can bypass it. And it's alarming the number of organizations that really don't need a third party to come in and look at it. They just need someone to spend a week or two looking at the implementation and come back with some recommendations on how to improve it. And you know, feed those recommendations back into your organization and into the roadmap on how you're gonna improve the information systems over the next year. Uh, I, you know, hardly ever when you implement something does it work exactly the way you thought, right? So just getting a, a fresh set of eyes on it is extremely helpful. So layered defenses, um, you know, if, if you really have those first three things crushed, like you're like, hey man, like we know all of our ingress, egress points going in and out to the internet, we've got those all monitored, they're locked down, but we got everything SSO'd and we got strong authentication on it and we're testing it. I mean, the next thing that I would really recommend is think about a layered defense strategy and namely really think about what are the crown jewels in my enterprise. And is there any additional protections around the crown jewels than there is the other information systems? And you know, generally speaking, you want to have some additional controls in place. Now, those are probably gonna be pretty specific because the crown jewels for each organization probably are gonna differ. You know, things that I've seen implemented in real life is, uh, you know, some organizations are really concerned about an attacker gaining access to C-level information systems. So they'll put additional monitoring on the C-level or board level members and uh, ensure that there's extra monitoring and detection on those. Uh, you know, other organizations are really concerned about some type of data they collect from users. So, so they'll move that into like a separate network segment and they'll put additional security controls both on the host and on the network layers. So really you've got to figure out what makes sense for your organization, but you know, if you think about cybersecurity um, not as a checklist, like I gotta do all this stuff on every single box, but if you really think about it as like, hey, there's a battle here, there's a terrain, right? Maybe it's a mountainous terrain, there's like a river in the terrain, there's a forest, right? And then you think like the attacker's gotta go from point A to point B, right, to get to the top of that mountain. What can I do to help make it more difficult for them to move through my information systems to get to the top of that mountain? So, and that's where a layered defense strategy really comes in play. I highly recommend, as much as possible, moving to an infrastructure as code or just an as code strategy in general. 
And, and the reason for this is, and I know this is a larger lift for a lot of organizations, but the reason for this is because then on the left side of the stack, you can programmatically state uh, when a vul new vulnerability comes out, you can modify a template and say like, okay, update this version of Sudo. Let's, let's take that Sudo vulnerability. The Sudo vulnerability comes out. What, what would you normally have to do in a, a traditional model? You would have to SSH into all your systems. You would have to do an upgrade on the SSH package, right? Or you'd have to have some type of solution that, that would do that. In an infrastructure as code model, you would go back to the template for your infrastructure and you would say in the template, don't use that version of Cydio anymore, use this version, and then you would redeploy your infrastructure using the new version. So, and I know a lot of organizations through use of containers and Kubernetes and, um, and even just people using cloud services who are using like kind of like the ARM templates on Azure or the CloudFormation templates on AWS, they're really able to leverage this kind of infrastructure as code concept. So as much as possible, when you're reducing the amount of time it takes you to make large scale changes across your enterprise, and you're really baking that into your organization's processes at the core, you're gonna see a huge, a huge security benefit, albeit it is kind of a culture shift. Okay, and then the last thing that I highly recommend, um, and this, I thought I had a background slide, but apparently maybe I skipped over it. But, uh, so just as a little background about myself. Um, so I'm Bryce Coons, I'm Tweak Fox on Twitter, so I, I used to work at Homeland, and at Homeland, I was over incident response and focus operation for their unclassified network. So there was over half a million computers there, and it was really my job when we thought malware and attacker got on a system to lead the incident response efforts there, as well as focus operations was kind of the term that we came up with before you know, Hunt and the APTs were really a thing, right? So we're really focused on kind of those nation states and, and trying to um, do cyber threat intel around them and, and come up with strategies on how to defeat them, right? So, so um, the biggest thing on the, on the defensive side is, is really just the ability to get visibility into both the endpoint and the network, right? So when you think something's suspicious, how long does it actually take you to triage that? Is it like I gotta open a JIRA ticket with some SRE and he's gotta go SSH to the box and then the SRE comes back and like everything looks cool, right? That's not, that's not good enough, right? He's not trained in cybersecurity. He doesn't have a background there. Um, so I think a lot of the tools that are out here which are in that kind of um, EDR type space will give you the ability to respond a lot quicker, get that visibility a lot quicker. So I highly recommend you check those out as well as kind of have the right standard operating procedures in place so that when an incident happens, you guys can go and triage it and remediate it without having to do um, you know, a lot of large changes. So um, yeah, so that's kind of my, where my background is on the defensive side and where these recommendations kind of come from. Um, you know, in, in full transparency, uh, you know, I've subsequently since then shifted to the offensive side and uh, um, I do, I, I used to work at NSA, I, I did red teaming type functions there, as well as I built red teams out for tech companies and whatnot, so. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of hands on the ground um, cases at this point in my life where um, security did not function well, right? Okay, great. Well, that's me. Um, I just wanted to kind of kick you off for a minute, get you oriented on the conference. And if there's any questions, uh, feel free to hit me up on Slack or Twitter. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Appreciate your time.